We know our God is faithful. The Bible confirms the love and devotion of the Almighty. His outstretched arms are always there, patiently waiting to receive us, to wrap us in His love. The book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, speaks to us in the words of Paul, which states, For I am persuaded, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Through His Word, and through His Spirit, we can experience the joy of new life by His redemptive power. And now, the Greater Refuge Church of Christ Church family invites you to share in God's eternal Word.
Praise the Lord, everybody. I greet you in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone is doing well and staying safe throughout this pandemic. I want each and every one of you to know that we're praying for you fervently, and we love you in Jesus' name. Uh, I will be reading the scripture from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. My scripture reading will be coming from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And verse 1 reads on this wise. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word, that it may sanctify our heart deep within. In Jesus' name, GRCC is praying for you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. At this time, we'll have our church announcements. On Tuesdays, we have Bible teaching. And that time to log on is at 7 o'clock. Bible teaching starts at 7.30 p.m. The facilitator is Elder Jesse Wilson. And the subject is Power to Endure Series. Then on Wednesdays, we have our Noonday Prayer, and that number for teleconference is 302-202-1108. The access code is 902-424. Also on Wednesday evenings, we have a midweek encouragement series, and we'd like you to join us on our website, in Jesus' name. On Thursdays, we have the Central Jersey Bible Institute that continues with the encouragement series. And we would like you to log on. It's a Zoom on Thursday nights, every Thursday, and on Fridays. We have great teaching. And we also would like you to remember those that need our prayers. Keep them in your hearts. Keep them in your mind. For God is a healer and a comforter. Amen. For our thought for the week, happiness cannot be traveled to, owned, earned, worn, or consumed. Happiness is the spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude in Jesus' name. At this time, we'll have a selection from our praise singers. Amen. We ask you to join in with us as we sing, the Lord is high above the heavens.
Praise the Lord and good morning. We do bring you greetings from the Greater Refuge Church of Christ, 600 Grand Avenue, Plainfield, New Jersey, where the pastor is Bishop Leon Harrell and the lady of the house is Mother Ida Harrell. Indeed, we do give honor to the Spirit of Christ that's head in our life. Amen. To the elders, the ministers, to the deacons and to their wives and to the church mothers, the missionaries, amen, to Sister Loria, our wife, and to all of God's children. We do greet you in that precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. And we do thank him for another worship Sunday that he has allowed us to come into, another opportunity just to lift up his name and to give him the glory, the honor, and the praise that is due unto him. When we consider the times that we're living in right now, we can certainly say we thank God for his keeping power and for his saving and sustaining grace. And today we'd like to call your attention to a passage of scripture in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 11 and we're going to read from verse 1 through verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1 through verse 6. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. And his anger was kindled greatly. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life, the sustaining strength that is in your word. We humble now in your presence as we come to the table, asking you if you will feed us with the manna from on high, as you have instructed us in the outline, the format for prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. So we ask, Lord, if you will do that in this spiritual table now. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. From this particular chapter in these six verses, we'd like to speak to you from the subject this morning, the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord. Life is filled with challenges, and sometimes we don't recognize the challenges, and we will describe them as other events in life and yet life is filled with challenges sometimes we'll call it a coincidence and even for some they'll say it's just bad luck but life is filled with challenges and these challenges come they try us they test us if we're not careful, they can break us. And so here, as we consider what a challenge is, in the 
technical sense. A challenge is a call or summons to engage in any contest. So then the question that begs to be asked is who institutes this contest or this conflict? So often I believe we give the devil more credit than he deserves when the children of God find themselves in tight or difficult situations. Oft times you may hear them remark that Satan is on my track and he's trying to turn me back or he has done this to my family or he has done this to my home. He has affected us this way or that way. And I think sometimes we give him too much credit. But the reality is when we talk about who or when we address that question of who institutes this contest or this conflict, what we should understand is that this contest or this conflict, this challenge began way before you and I came on the scene. If we go back, the Bible tells us that Satan, who was once known as Lucifer, when he was in heaven and was the choir director for the angelic host, he got beside himself and allowed the sin of pride to enter him, to enter his being. Once it entered him, he made the most incorrect statements he could make, is that I will set my throne above God's throne. And when the Lord looked at Lucifer's actions and recognized and made it clear there can be only one God and that God is me. Isaiah 42 and 8 says he declared I am the Lord that is my name my glory will I not give to another neither my praises to graven images. So the Lord had Satan or Lucifer thrown out of heaven. Even Jesus in his earthly ministry when God was in flesh on earth. He said I beheld Satan fall from heaven as lightning. So if we really want to address the question who institutes this challenge or this contest or this conflict that the children of God often find themselves in. It started in heaven. And once Lucifer lost his place in heaven and God created man in Genesis chapter 2 from the dust of the ground, Lucifer now Satan decided I'll destroy his crowning glory, which is man. And it is not about you or I or man, but it is about the God that made us. If I can destroy his crowning creation, then I can show him that I am above him. But we know that this cannot happen. And so even though Satan, a man, moved against Adam and Eve, and Adam did sin and fall, nevertheless, God did not give up on his creation. And God made a way of escape. And even in that way of escape, amen, man would multiply. So much so until there came a time when the Lord selected one man out of many by the name of Abram and vowed to him that he would make of his seed a great nation and establish through him the twelve tribes of Israel. And it is here that the enemy is going to attack the elect of God in the Old Testament. And so when we come to the scripture text, we must remember that when we talk about the men of Jabesh Gilead, that these were the elect of God in the Old Testament, the household of Israel. And one thing that the devil is always after, he's after that that belongs to God. 
And so here now we see the children of God, the household of Israel, the men of Jabesh Gilead. Praise the Lord. And it is here that the children of Israel has just gone through a recent change, uh, political change. Uh, when you read back a little further in 1 Samuel, you'll find that uh, Israel had come into Canaan. They were now settled in that land of promise. And it is here that they looked at the other surrounding nations and said, we want a king to sit on a throne for us as the other nations have. And so now Israel wants to move from a theocracy to a monarchy. They want to move from the theocracy, meaning they are governed by God and God alone. Now they want to move to a democracy where there is a man who rules them. And so the Lord said, I am your king. But Israel wanted an earthly king. And so the Lord allowed them a king, an earthly king. And this first king of Israel by the name of Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin and from the family of Matri. And here they have just anointed Saul as their first king. And so once Saul is anointed king, he returns home, praise the Lord, and continues his daily functions. He returns and continues to till the soil and to care for the land of his home. And so here the enemy, the enemy looks at the children of God and sees them in a position of change, going from a theocracy to a monarchy. And Saul, their newly appointed and anointed king, has gone back home to Gibeah. Uh, and so it is here now that the enemy sees that in this governmental change that they are weak and here is our opportunity to overthrow them. The enemy is always looking for an opening, looking for a place where he can get in and upset God's plan. But I want you to know that our God is omniscient. He not only understands us, but he knows the end before the beginning. And so when the enemy sees what looks like an opportunity to destroy us, God is only going to use it as an opportunity to change our testimony. Praise the Lord. And so, amen, the enemy seeing this as an opportunity to attack God's people as they are in the midst of of a governmental change. And so it is Nahash, which means serpent, who brings the Ammonite army and surrounds Jabesh Gilead and says to the men of Jabesh Gilead, there is no way you can match us. And so you might as well give in. And here the men of Jabesh Gilead realizing that when we look at their numbers and when we look at their ability and we look at our numbers and our ability, there is no way we can match them. There is no way we can enter battle or conflict with them and expect to overcome. And here there is a lesson to be learned. If we look at the enemy and the size of his army, then our God seems small. But if we look at our God and the fact that he is able to do all things and cannot fail, then it will cause the enemy to seem small. It's about how you see it. But the men of Jabesh Gilead saw themselves as inferior and said to Nahash, we will surrender. We know we cannot compete, uh, but 
I want you to know that even if you try to work with the enemy, it is a known fact that the enemy does not play fair. And so even in committing to surrender, the men of Jabesh Gilead found out about the cruelty of Nahash. And the name Nahash means serpent. They found out concerning the cruelty of the serpent. Nahash said, well, if you surrender, these are my terms that I'm going to put out the right eye of each of you so that it will be a reproach against Israel. And to understand what Nahash is saying here, I'm going to put out your right eye of each of you. And that is, first of all, he says for a reproach. But that is, amen, to show that their God was not able to keep them. And they will wear this badge of dishonor for the rest of their lives with their right eye removed. Not only is it a badge of dishonor, and a mark to show that their God wasn't able, but it is also a means of dehumanizing, demilitarizing, amen, the men of Jabez Gilead, making it so that they could never be an effective warrior again. But I thank God that even when the enemy breathes his threats, the Bible says he'll come at you one way, but flee seven ways. What a mighty God we serve. And so now, since the serpent Nahash has added this condition to the surrender, the men of Jabesh Gilead says, well, we need to think about this. If it was just a peaceful surrender, we were ready to give in. But now with the conditions you have established, we need some time to think about it. On oh, Nahash, will you give us seven days and let us see if we can get some help. And if we can't get any help, then we will surrender based on your terms. And so here are the men of Jabesh Gilead forming a letter, a request of help that would be sent out by servants throughout the coasts of Israel. Each location that the messengers stopped, the response was, I'm sorry, but we can't help you. We're dealing with our own issues. We've got our own problems. We're trying to survive ourselves. And I wonder, saints of God, have you ever been in that place where your situation seemed so bleak and seemed that there was no way you would survive it? You reached out to your brother. You reached out to your sister. And the response you received was I'm in the same situation or my situation is worse than yours and so the feeling is where is my help going to come from and so the messengers continued going from locale to locale here is the letter from the men of Jabesh here is the situation here is the request for help Everyone, I can't help them right now. Uh, have you ever heard folks just say, I'll pray for you. That's the best I can do for you right now. But Jabesh was in trouble. The men of Jabesh Gilead were in dire straits. Finally, the messengers come to Saul's hometown of Gibeah. And when they arrive in Gibeah, Saul is in the field with a yoke of oxen. The messengers read the letter to the inhabitants of Gibeah. Amen. That crowded around to hear. And when they heard what the men of Jabesh Gilead were going through and what was facing them, the Bible says they lifted up their voice and they wept. They began to cry. And, and, and when they cried, I'm sure there was an emotion there that said, I feel for them and, and I feel for the situation that they are in.
<laughs> but I want you to know feeling is not enough to get you out of the enemy's plan. Feelings are not enough to deliver you when the enemy has you surrounded. Feeling is not enough to change the circumstance. We feel for you. They broke down in tears and, and began to cry with a loud grieving cry. And Saul is returning from tending to the field with that yoke of oxen. And Saul hears the lamenting cry of the people of Gibeah. And Saul asked a question. He said, what's going on here? Why are the people crying with such bitterness? And so they explained to Saul the letter, the request of help that was read to the inhabitants of Gibeah from the men of Jabesh Gilead. And the Bible tells us that when Saul heard, when they read the report to Saul, rather than Saul breaking down in tears and crying or walking away as if it was not his problem. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit of God came upon him. Ah, oh, Lord, that's the subject today. The Spirit of the Lord. When we are in dire situations, such as what we're facing right now in our world. Man, we don't need to just sit around and go into the fetal position and cry over the threats of the enemy or the conditions that exist that seem so negative and insurmountable. But we need to go to the rock that is higher than I. The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon Saul. And so when the spirit of the Lord came on Saul, the Bible says he took the oxen and broke them, ripped them apart and took the pieces of the oxen and sent it to the locations in Israel and said, look, if you don't come and gather and help your brethren that are in Jabesh, the men of Jabesh Gilead, then what has happened to this oxen being ripped to shreds and pieces will happen to you. When the Spirit of the Lord is in the place, when it comes into the situation, you don't speak in fear. You don't speak speak in tears but you speak in power you speak in authority notice Saul he's not speaking in tears but he's speaking in authority and saying the Lord is going to respond to what I say don't you know that the power of life and death is in the tongue if you speak negativity the negativity is coming in your direction if you speak weakness, then weakness is coming in your direction. If you speak failure, then failure is coming in your life. But when you speak of the power of God, when you speak of the ability of God, when you speak, amen, of the authority of God, then that's what will enter your life. Here is Saul now that the Spirit of the Lord has come on him. He is now speaking under the power and the authority of God sends the message to the other locations in Israel and says if you don't rally together to save your brethren then the same thing that happened to this yoke of oxen is going to happen to you and so they begin to ride ah oh, glory Saul said we're going to meet and by the time they met there were 3,000 men, praise the Lord, from Judah, praise the Lord, and 30,000 from Israel, praise the Lord. And when they came together at Bezek on one accord, 33,000 ready to come and to bring help to the men of Jabesh Gilead. And when I read this scripture and consider this circumstance, what comes to mind is how, amen, the men of Jabesh Gilead had to write a letter 
and sent a request for help. But church, as Israel was the elect of the Old Testament, and as the enemy attacked the elect of the Old Testament through Nahash, the serpent, and the Ammonites, he's doing the same thing to God's elect of the New Testament, which is the church, the bride of Christ. He is attacking the church. He has never let up from the early days when Stephen was stoned to death and martyred because of his preaching of the gospel. He has not let up. He is still attacking the church. And we must get beyond seeing the church as the building on the corner with the steeple. But the church is the spiritual body of Christ. And so if you have been born again, and I mean Holy Ghost field. When I say born again, I'm not talking about taking the preacher's hand and saying I give God my heart. No, the church isn't something that you join and come into the church you're born into. It is a living organism. And so if you are a born again child of God, and I mean born again, one that has repented of your sins and accepted Christ as your Savior and allowed him to enter your life speaking in tongues. And then as the Spirit of God gives the utterance, then you can say, yes, I've been born again. I'm now under new management. That old serpent that used to rule my life doesn't rule it anymore. But now now I'm under a new ownership and his name is Jesus. Oh how sweet the name Jesus to every sinner's ears. It soothes my doubts and it calms my fears. Oh how precious is that name Jesus just like Nahash and just like the army of the Ammonites. The enemy is still attacking the church and just just like they wanted to take the eyes of the men of Jabesh Gilead. He's trying to take your sight. He doesn't want you to see God for who he is. He wants you to doubt him. He wants you to see him as less than what he is. He wants you to believe that the current situation I'm in is beyond God's authority. But I want you to know there is no God like our God. And there's nothing you can get in that he can't get you out of. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before him. Heaven and earth, they do adore him. And so he's attacking the church now the same way that Nahash did and in his attack he's trying to disrupt our vision he doesn't want us to see God for who he is and for what he can do in our situation but I encourage you today saints hold to God unchanging hand amen Jabesh the men of Jabesh had to write a letter and send for help but the church we don't need to write a letter. We don't need to send for help. Ah, glory. And we don't even need to look and see if help is on the way. Because I've come to tell you, help arrived over 2,000 years ago in an upper room when there were about 120 that were in one place, in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto each of them cloven tongues like as of unto fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. Those on the outside heard the saints rejoicing and said their 
full of new wine. They're drunk. But Peter stood up, being full of the Holy Ghost. And the first message was delivered. These are not drunk as ye suppose. Or should I say the second message was delivered. Because the first message was delivered in tongues. Divers tongues. But then the second message, Peter preached. These are not drunk as ye suppose. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It is here now. The Lord has opened up heaven and poured out his spirit. He has opened the doors of the church on Pentecost. And so since Pentecost, we don't have to look for help. We have the help within us. The Lord told the disciples before he was crucified, I'm going to leave you. But when I leave, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send another comforter called the paraclete. And I'm so glad that we we have the paraclete today. We have that comforter today called the Holy Spirit of promise. And you don't need to go look for it or write a letter to your senator. You don't have to write a letter to your pastor. But all you got to do is take a look on the inside. Right now in these difficult and in these challenging times that we are going through, you can't look to the president to get you out of this. You can't look to the senators to get you out of this. You can't look to mama or daddy to get you out of this. Even your brother and your sister are dealing with their issues. But if you will just take a look inside, you'll find that help is not on the way. But help is here. It arrived a long time ago. The day you received the Holy Ghost and it accepted Christ in your life. The help arrived. It's there. And right now what you're going through the enemy is trying to tell you this is for your destruction. This will be your doom. This will be your last battle. But if the enemy is saying it, then you know it's got to be a lie. And God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But I'll be with you always. And he's with you right now. And so, unlike the men of Jabesh Gilead, we don't need to sin for Saul. The spirit of the Lord came on Saul. Because in the Old Testament, the spirit moved on the children of God. But in the New Testament, the Spirit is within the children of God. And it's time for us to resort to what we have. Stop leaning on the government. Stop leaning on your job. Stop leaning on your friends. It's time to lean on Jesus. I know that your job is talking about letting you go. And you're wondering how we're going to make ends meet meet when we're barely making it meet with a check coming in. But our God is greater than any paycheck. He's greater than any company or corporation. Take a step back and say, Lord, it's in your hands. We are staying up at night. Can't get a good night's sleep because the enemy is surrounding you. But that's all right. All the Lord is doing is is changing your testimony. He's taking you from what was to what shall be. And he's saying to you, trust me. Put me in. Let me work on your behalf. Let me do what only I can do. And if you let me, I'll show you how victory feels. If you let me, I'll show you how victory is one church today let's get away from the form and the fashion and let's go back to the spirit of the Lord let's go back to breaking down the altar let's go back to storming heaven's gates in prayer it's praying time it's deliverance time it's time to get out of self 
and let the spirit of the Lord have a free course. Souls are ready to be saved. Sick are ready to be healed. 